When MOOCs first came out, um, there was all this uh, excitement about MOOCs and how MOOCs were going to revolutionize mm -hmm. education. And uh, Amy and I were some of the first people, just very on, early on in the MOOC hype, to say, look, if there's going to be impact for MOOCs, it's probably more in this idea that um, you would blend a MOOC with a face-to-face -face course. And this now, I think, has become common received wisdom. But you know, at the time, people were talking about, it's going to eliminate classrooms. And we were like, you know, hold it. You know, what's really good, where the real impact is going to be is, is the traditional course plus a MOOC, you know, that sort of thing. It's going to be as a supplement. Uh, and, you know, and I think time has proven us right yeah. you know, on that. Yeah. And so, and so my, uh, you know, my, my obsession for the past nine, ten years has been about this idea of reuse. Like, we can talk all about openness that we want and uh, open materials and uh, open education. But where the rubber meets the road is to what extent are these things reused? To what, I mean, it's no good. You, so you publish something open. And no one used it, no one extended it, no one built on it. Who cares? You might as well have buried it in your yard, right? Um, so I tend to be the gadfly out there saying, it's great to build something that's open, but in what ways are you thinking about how this gets reused, extended? In what ways, you know, if you put out a digital textbook that's open and there's no tools for students to annotate it, for professors to customize it, like, why is that? Why are you making it difficult for people to make things better, right? Um, so I, I, I see openness that does not think about and try to encourage reuse as being sort of a false sense of open. And, um, and that's, that's my shtick, and that's probably what connects the MOOC work to the stuff I'm doing now with Federated Education, which is, um, you know, it's, it's great to have these, these models, but we need to make sure that people are really encouraged to extend others' work. Student blogging, I think, is great, but the problem with student blogging is I have an idea and I throw it up on a blog, and you can't say, oh, this is idea, idea is great, and, and I got two, you know, two things I'd love to add to it. I mean, stop focusing on open and start looking at, the way you know you're successful with open is when people are reusing the materials. You know, it is too easy to say, oh, we did, we did 1,800 open publications or, you know, there's, there's, uh, we did all this, you know, MIT put out, you know, however many open courses. The, the question is, to what extent do people reuse those and to what extent do they make them better? And that's when you know you're successful. The side of open pedagogy mm -hmm. that we have, we have kind of forgotten about over the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's a really important side because when you're looking to build a culture of science, you know, blogging is fine, student blogging is fine. Blogging is a great way to have students reflect, draw connections and so forth. But what we really need to be teaching, you know, there, there was a line in the keynote this morning um, where the, the speaker said, you know, we have this entire program of science and we won't even take a week to show our students how to collaborate over the internet. And then, and then, you know, and then went on to say, um, you know, we can we can we can graduate all these all these people with these degrees that we want. We can apply all this money we want if we can't figure out this collaboration problem. You know, I, I think his exact words were, "We're all screwed anyway." <laughs> you know, because it doesn't matter how many smart people you have if if they don't know how to use those tools. First step I think you need is, uh, well, I mean, so there's some debate about what the first step is. I mean, you have a grassroots sort of, sort of approach where you go out and you find faculty willing to do this, and that's good. But I think you also need a top-down approach, and what you need to do is you need to treat your digital literacies um, as a core competency, just the same way you would have treated critical thinking or, or whatever, whatever, whatever the core competencies are that you're um, claiming get transferred to students. Um, you've got to articulate that, and it has to be, it has to be at the same level as you know, critical thinking, as scientific literacy. If it's not, then we, again we get into this problem. It's hard. Yeah. So, so, so um, 
you can go different routes with this, but um, you know, a, a basic one is, is critical consumption. So we all know how to look through journals, right, and, and try to determine the um, reliability of a journal article via citations and so forth. And we spend a lot of time walking students through that process. And then what we tell them is just use journals, don't go online. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, you know, that's one way of doing it. You know, that's one way of doing it. But that, what that's, that's locking out this, if you say, well, the solution to reliability is to only use journals, right? You're locking out all this other stuff that could inform our work, accelerate our work, in something that moves faster than, you know, a six-month, 12-month, 18-month cycle, right? So critical consumption is, you know, how do I find reliable information from experts on the internet? How do I connect with those experts in ways where I'm sure that the information I'm getting is valid, reliable, and useful, right? Um, collaboration. So this is your sort of wiki thing. How do we find ways to build and extend on each other's work without, you know, while still giving credit, right? While um, avoiding the sort of flame wars that can erupt. Like, how do we digitally collaborate? And I think I think wiki's a piece of that, but I think I think there's other things that are a piece of that. Um, if you look at uh, so uh, critical consumption, uh, collaboration, um, I think there's I think there's a I think there's a, a room for um, uh, you know digital identity, right? So how do you build a digital identity online that a adequately reflects you and helps people find you? I mean, it's not just about do I look good, but you want a digital footprint where um, the people you really need to know in your work find you and connect with you. So some people think, well, this is vain. You just want to look good on the internet. No, it's you want it to represent you in such a way so that when someone bumps into one of the edges of your digital identity on the internet, they say, you know, you know, I should write a paper with this guy. I, I'm gonna let's 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 contact each other and let's get going on this, you know? Because the the truth is most problems that we're faced with um, right now, the solution is out there. It is out there. But the problem is, you know, piece A of that solution is over in this guy's head, right? Piece B is in this guy's head. Piece C is in this uh, woman's head over in Bangalore, right? And the challenge is to get piece A, B, and C to come together and produce the next cure for cancer, you know, to produce the next radiology analytics tool, to, to do whatever that's going to be. And, and that is where the solutions increasingly come from, is when three people happen to meet in a room somewhere and they start talking about their work and then they're able to build off of that. But there aren't enough rooms <laughs> for people to have those serendipitous meetings. So we need to use, we need to use the net-enabled tools that make that just a, a way of happening. And, and you know this if you've been on, uh, on the internet. We have a more advanced system for sharing and improving recipes in this country, in this world, than we do for sharing and improving science. You can get a recipe on Pinterest or somewhere, um, put it up there, and it will go through iterations. In three weeks, you'll have a better recipe that is out to a million people who wanted to learn how to cook that exact thing. And there, is, there are so many problems in science that would benefit from exactly that. It would, today, again, in the keynote, one of the things he was talking about was lab procedures, and it seems really bland. But you know, what are the lab procedures that allow you to do this work? And how do you create efficiency in your lab? And no one writes it down, no one shares it, and it doesn't get routed to other labs. And so we lose these massive amounts of productivity because I'm sitting over here in um, you know, Portland or something, you know, and I've got a lab efficiency problem. And I go out to look and see what are some solutions to this. People have the solutions, but they're not findable. They, they don't route their way to me. Um, and if, if, if they were findable, right, and if they did route their way to me, uh, we could take all the genius that we're putting, you know, instilling in our students, and we wouldn't be wasting it, you know, with lab procedures that actually are not efficient, right? So th all these things reduce our capacity to solve problems. So, uh, I mean, because the student wants to solve problems, and the student is going to be 
um, at, their, at their most creative and their most productive um, if they have opportunities to connect their ideas with other ideas that are out there. But as long as those ideas are tacit, the, uh, they're not going to do it. One of, the, one of the great things about being at a top-ranked university is not just that you have those teachers, right? But that you bump into the ideas of other students who are working on these, on these problems, and you maybe make those connections that introduce you to your life's work, right? But that's not everybody. I mean, there's a limited, you know, there's a limited number of students who are just going to happen to be in the same physical space as the, say, the other person that's working on another half the problem and discover what their life's work's gonna be. On the internet, there is no limit to that. You know, the internet is a serendipity mm -hmm. engine. It creates these serendipitous meetings, and people can discover, uh, you know, um, areas that they would like to investigate that would have never occurred to them. Just be careful of these blanket statements that really make students feel like, well, if you want to be successful, you'll stay away from, from internet resources. Mm -hmm. Because in a small sense, that may be true, that like if you cite Wikipedia, you're not going to go that far in academia, right? But in a larger sense, the truth is, um, and again, as we heard uh, you know, uh, this morning, uh, the people that learn to digitally collaborate uh, produce uh, a massive amount of more published papers than the people that don't digitally collaborate. So if you're looking for uh, you know, a good takeaway from your students, especially in the sciences, say, you know, would you like to be published? You know, because you can tell them you know, your chance of being published you know, will, in, in this case, it, doubled or something, right, you know, b b by, by being part of a, a digital collaborative network. People say, you know, oh, well, you know, Wikipedia is horrible. The students shouldn't cite Wikipedia. And they're right. And the reason why, though, is not that it's Wikipedia is because you're at university, you shouldn't be citing encyclopedias anymore, right? <laughs> this isn't a book report, right? This is a research report. Um, so we get hung up on that conversation. Should you cite Wikipedia? And we can, we can end that conversation now. No. Do not cite Wikipedia in a professional paper. It's Wikipedia. It's a reference. It's not about the reliability. It's about the fact that it's a reference work. Now, what Wikipedia is really useful for is that Wikipedia, um, even more than an encyclopedia, all the claims in Wikipedia are extensively cited and referenced you know, to print publications at the bottom of each article. right? And so I can look at a claim in Wikipedia, and I can follow that, and I can get a, get, a, get a starting point you know, where I can look at that, find that, and then move out from that published work to its citations and so forth. So just teaching students to do that and saying, you know, instead of just saying, don't cite Wikipedia, just saying, look, here's where Wikipedia is useful, that it actually moves out into the citation network. You know? And so, so little things like that, too, and it's hard to get faculty it's hard to get faculty to understand, understand that, that even outside of the fact we don't teach it directly, which I think we need to do, there's a lot of faculty that are, are reinforcing the opposite with things that they make and dismissive comments they make because they're not, they're, they're, they can be so nuanced in their discipline, but when it comes to these digital tools, it's all black and white to them, you know, and, and, that, and that's, a, that's a problem. They need to develop nuance about, about these tools. I would encourage people to even examine just, you know, regular, regular wiki for all its problems. We end up with this sort of Groundhog Day where people just say the same things over and over and nobody actually builds on an idea. So we had this fabulous example in history of Wikipedia where um, a couple stub pages produced uh, the largest um, collaborative work in the history of mankind, the largest intellectual work in the history of mankind. And we haven't duplicated that largely because um, at the early stages of knowledge, Wikipedia and wiki culture often locks people out. So what Federated Wiki is, is about inverting the structure. So you have a system right now where multiple people feed into a single wiki. Uh, what Federated Wiki does is each person has their own individual wiki, but these wikis feed into your browser in a way that makes it look like one wiki. But the way it works is this. I'm going through and I'm looking at people's uh, stuff in my federation and all these articles, and I'm, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at uh, the ones that are sort of in my network, and I come to something that I disagree with, right? Or something I want to extend or elaborate on. 
I go in, I click, I edit that, and what happens is on my server, that page changes. And then everybody else in the network has their own little mini server, and they see that there's a change I've made. And they can either take that change, say that that's a good, that's a good idea, I would like to host that, or they can not take that change, but we don't sit around and endlessly and endlessly berate each other for being stupid. I read a wiki, which is um, part of a larger uh, thing around ideas of different models for collaboration and uh, for pedagogy. And the idea of, um, it's perhaps easiest to explain with the example of wiki, right? The, the idea of a traditional wiki is you have multiple people and they all you know, plug into this central server and then you look at that work on the server and any given page ends up being people, you know, uh, discuss or um, sometimes argue. Uh, uh, so for any given page, people will discuss or argue uh, about what that page should be and there's one page on the server and that becomes, um, that becomes the community statement, right, on, on whatever that idea is. And that's a good model because it, it, it pushes people to discuss things and, and try to decide what's the proper way to say this thing. But it's, it's also a bad model because it forces people to do that right away, right? So you go on Wikipedia right now and you say, um, you know, hey, I'm going to just make this small little edit. You're not just going to make that small little edit. You're going to make that small little edit, and then you're going to have three days of conversation about whether that edit can stay there, right? And so this, this actually pushes people away from sharing, pushes people away from collaboration. And, and what, we've, what we've ended up with because of that is if, if you think about, if you go all the way back to you know, the beginnings of Web 2.0, you, know, you had blogs over here and you had wikis, and they were kind of seen in 2004 as these, these kind of equivalent trends that were going to grow. And what we found is these, the blogging culture of Twitter, of Instagram, you know, of Tumblr has actually taken off and people, people do this very natively. Wiki culture hasn't had the same success, right? And that's kind of a shame because when we look at what people are doing on Twitter and when we look at what people are doing with blogging, people are getting their ideas out there. But there's no push to come to that consensus, right? There's no push to say, I'm gonna take your idea I'm going to edit it, I'm going to build on it and extend it. So I've been working with this federated wiki idea. I've been using it in some classroom context so that each student has their own wiki. And then the concept that we use is the students publish their work on their wiki, and other students are encouraged to go out and we, you know, we call it forking, right? We, we, the other students are encouraged to go out and fork the work of other students that they believe is good. Right, and bring it to their bring it to their wiki. And so, as you so you, what you're trying to get students to do is to produce work that other students believe will make their wiki better. Right, and this changes the way we think about student collaboration, where we're going to have a group and we're going to all be graded on a group project. Now, what you want to do is two things: you want your wiki to be awesome, right, and you want your work that you produce to be reused by others. And so, there's there's a dual right. There's a dual objective now. And that the important second piece of that objective is it's not good enough just for my wiki to be, um, for our wiki to be good. The work I personally produce, I should be trying to make it useful to others so that so that they will they will fork it. There's visual uh, this visualization okay. stuff in it where you can see that um, this particular piece of content or this particular student um, has had their work uh, you know forked uh, all over the wiki. It's sort of like citations, and, and in fact, this model of individuals uh, produce things that disagree with one another, but then get cited or in, built into larger, uh, larger uh, productions. And this model of citation uh, is is actually very similar to science in the way that science works. And so it was interesting with the keynote this morning. A lot of what he's talking about is exactly the obsessions that 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 I identify with, which is. You know, it's great to talk about, oh, well, this is open. But if it's open and it's just broadcast, 
if it's not if it's not available to reuse to extend to build on and if we don't teach students to do that if we teach students always you know start from scratch never use someone else's work you know never build on something move something it's not easy and, that, and I think that's one of the struggles with wiki is collaboration's not easy and so when people come to it they say well you know I find wiki really difficult and uh, part of the answer to that is you know it's difficult because it's difficult but you know so so is um, you know <laughs> so is bioinformatics you know so is statistics you know so is so is calculus I mean these things are difficult but there are some things you need to know how to do and, and, and one thing that we desperately need to know how to do in society is how to share ideas, make sure those ideas get routed to the right people, make sure the people they're routed to have ways to extend them and feed them back into public knowledge. You know, and, and yes, is that really, is it hard to build habits and understandings around how that works? Um, absolutely, it may be as hard as calculus, but if it's something we need to do, we need to do it. And, you know, it's no good sitting around and saying, well, you know, we're universities, but this is hard, so let's not, let's not tackle it. And, and I, I've, I've been excited about the institutions that embrace this, but I've also been a little depressed by, you know, people that come who are, um, you know, I mean, who may have a degree in neurobiology or something. You know, and then they say, well, well, you know, I can't, my students didn't really go for wiki. Wiki is hard. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know. That's the university said, you know, your students have, have come to us and they've said that your neurobiology class is difficult. Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd really, we're going to get rid of neurobiology. Students have to know what they have to know. And, and there is no doubt, there is all the research you could want to prove that students do not know how to collaborate online in that, the, um, you know, both from the sense of being citizens and from the sense of being professionals, they need to know that is out there. And yet, this is something that we only do when it's easy. And that's the thing that has to change. We have to make a commitment that we're actually going to do this even when it's hard. So we go into this, we scare students about plagiarism, right? And I, I understand, you know, we've got to be careful about that. But then what, we, what we're unconsciously teaching them is, really do everything from scratch. Never take someone else's idea and move it forward two inches because you want it to be your idea and you want it to be all your idea. And you, so we create this individualistic culture that reinvents the wheel every six months.